Hello everyone, I'm Janelle Gary and I'm one of the co-founders of New Generation. Hello, my name is Chardonnay Beaver and I'm also one of the co-founders of New Generation. And my name is Kevon Avery and I'm also a co-founder of New Generation. <laughs> Um, we would also like to acknowledge our other members who unfortunately aren't able to be here today, but Moya McKinney, um, Miles Gillespie, Israel Presley, Savelle Smalls, and Jamaica H. Um, so before what we like to open up with as new generation is a saying from West Africa, the Khan people. And um, the saying is boa me na me, moa wo and it means help me and let me help you. So before we get started, if everyone can just repeat the saying after me and with like some passion, you know, cause we're all here for the same thing. So, Boa. Boa. Me na me. Me na me. Mo wo wo. Mo wo wo. Thank you. So the reason why we do that is we also, we learned it from uh, Mr. Hagopian's class, his ethnic studies class. We've had the privilege to be in that class. And it just gives us a sense to be connected with our ancestors because our language was stolen and there's a lot of history that we don't know behind it. And we also like to use it just for like a sense of community and to just become one. <clears throat> Thank you, Janelle. So first we're gonna talk about how our group all started. We've been established for one year now. Uh, in June 2017, Charlena Lyles, a Seattle Public Schools mother, was shot and killed by our local police, two of them. When hearing about that, it was very compelling to us because each one of us have black mothers and none of us could imagine having to deal with that pain and that struggle that some of us are fortunate enough to not have to deal with and carry on a day-to-day -day basis. And so in less than 24 hours, we met with Mr. Hagopian, got a rally started at Garfield with media coverage, and we all used our sense of uh, grief, and we took that with passion, and we made it happen, and through that, we've been going ever since. The mission of New Generation is to reach people inside and outside the black community and teach them about police brutality, implicit bias, racism, slavery, all the isms that we have to deal with as youth. So um, a couple of things that our group has done through the past year and some of our accomplishments are, is we had a car wash, um, our first annual car wash. Um, we also won the Youth Student Award from um, Mr. Hagopi and the Michael Bennett Foundation. Um, we were a part of the 45th and 46th um, Roots Picnic, which is the old timers picnic held every year at the African American Museum. And we also had an assembly for um, Charlena Lyles that was remember her name. And we changed it from say her name to hashtag remember her name because a lot of times people's message gets lost in social media and we just see them as hashtags. And we wanted to make sure that you will remember her and her legacy will continue. And she's just not something that's just gonna be popular or what's new on social media for like a month or so until the next African American male or female is shot. So. That was a really um, big deal. It was in the Quincy Jones Auditorium. Um, look out for more information because we'll be having another one this year. And um, I'm gonna go and start on with a story that I have for you guys um, that helps relate me to the book, how I relate to it, um, The Master Narrative. So I went to Madrona K through eight and I started there in kindergarten, which is a majority African American school administration was black, most of the kids were black, and having that experience, I was just like, oh, Seattle's, you know, it's just black, because that's all I've seen my whole life. So I didn't really know, I was like, okay. And so I went there, kindergarten through eighth grade, and so I was basically here in the Central District watching the change of gentrification and watching how my school was changing a little bit, but it still stayed majority black till eighth grade. and. Once I got to high school, I was in this program called Y Scholars, which is for black students who are going to the AP program and honors program. And so I will never forget my first day, my freshman year, it was my honors world history class. And I walk in and the only thing I see is just a bunch of white faces and just one African-American male. 
And I just remember my eyes just looking dead straight at him. And he really wasn't looking at me. I could tell he knew the kids from like the school prior that he went to, because other middle schools had that honors program. But unfortunately, Madrona didn't. So it was my first time walking in cold with the honors and AP, so I had no idea what it was going to be like. And so immediately intimidation, using vocabulary words that I never even had to use or even really needed to learn about code switching yet because I was already around my own people, basically, like I said, my whole life. So once I got there, immediately I was intimidated, went straight down to the wise scholars room, and I remember talking to the wise scholars, um, counselors, and telling them, you gotta switch me with more people and wise scholars. Two days later, I got into a new class, and I saw more black faces. Chardonnay was in there, and she went to Madrona as well. So autom automatically, I was like, woo, it was, it was great. But it was still that intimidation in the back of my head because a lot of these kids had a head start, which I didn't. And it didn't make me feel capable and just being a different skin color and just some of the vocabulary that they still even use in AP is shocking and even in honors that we're still using this vocabulary and it's going on to almost 2019 and just some of the vocabulary we use is like hurtful and degrading. So a lot of the times I found myself not wanting to raise my hand if I knew the answer or maybe my sentence wouldn't make sense to the other kids because I was using slang. And so just a lot of intimidation. And so then, junior year, I was blessed and I was fortunate to have Mr. Hagopian who goes to Garfield High School and he teaches there. And I remember hearing about him my freshman year, BSC was really big and I was like, okay, I'm gonna get involved. And so I walked into his ethnic studies class and where you learn about the master narrative. And I realized right then and there, just in the first day of learning about the master narrative, how my whole life I was taught a master narrative with everybody else. So when I got into the group New Generation, everyone was thinking, oh, I'm educated on everything. You know all this about black lives and stuff. At the end of the day, I don't. I'm still trying to undo the system and undo the master narrative that I was taught just like everybody else. So when people or teachers or even people, my peers come up to me like, can you help me with this? Can you teach me this? It's still kind of like, I'm still trying to undo myself. And most of the education that I've learned is to be honest, just learning through social media. Not everybody in every school district's blessed enough to have somebody like Mr. Hagopian that's right in their school that wants to learn and wants to teach people their background and history, not only just racism, but sexism as well. That's also coming with the African-American community a lot because black women don't really get their credit. And so there's this quote on page 10 for uh, teaching for black um, lives, and it's teaching for black lives also means considering the loneliness of learning about one's history when you might be one of the few students in class or few teachers in school that this history represents. And that stuck out to me the most because, like I said, I felt alone and I felt like none of my teachers were going to be able to relate to me. And just reading that in the book really lets me know that first that I wasn't crazy and that it's really important that not only just black teachers know, but also my white teachers know as well, or also my other people of color teachers know as well. And also that my administration knows what's going on and to also know that other kids are also not alone and that there are a few of us that still feel this way and that it's okay that you can be white and speak up on an issue that you feel that's going wrong in the classroom. So I just wanted to thank Mr. Hagopian and I really thank everybody who's here and this book is amazing and I really, if you haven't read it yet, please read it. And if you have, read it again and suggest it to someone because it really touched my heart in a way more than you will ever know. Thank you. was speaking truth. Whew. Talking about white teachers understanding our history, uh, this book is extremely powerful. And one chapter that stood out to me was When Black Lives Mattered, Why Teach Reconstruction uh, by Adam Sanchez. And so I recall my first time learning about the Reconstruction era. It was my junior year of high school last year. 
And I had to make a decision going from my sophomore year into my junior year, where you're gonna drop AP, even though it looks really good to colleges, or you're gonna really want to strive to know your history for once and actually hear from another narrative, your narrative. And I already knew telling my friends who were signing up for AP or didn't really know why I wasn't taking AP. I said, this is for my history. They don't teach black history. And some of them were astonished, but it's the truth. My history aren't in those textbooks and I had to go somewhere to where it was. And so I recall walking into my honors US history class, Kivon was my classmate, and the teacher was Mr. Leslie. Uh, he is a Garfield teacher and has been teaching for a few years now. And anybody who comes and visits Garfield, if you are a white presenting male, straight as well, please talk to him because he can give you a lot of pointers. <laughs> okay, so one thing that I admire about Mr. Hagopian was that he created a trail initially coming into Garfield, knowing that, okay, we're in a city where it's being gentrified, primarily black. In Madrona, the school that Janelle and I went to, the founders of the Seattle Black Panther Party, Aaron Dixon, Elmer Dixon, grew up in that neighborhood. And to see it being changed and gentrified and now houses being worth more than a million dollars is insane. And so he knew there's something I have to do different. There's something, some story that I have to tell differently because Seattle's not getting it and these students are the future. And I appreciated that from him. And through his decision and courageous actions, Mr. Leslie, admiring him took up that skill as well. And so what he did was he got to know our history and not through the white lens, I'm sorry, those who know Strayer textbooks, not through Strayer, he got to know it through us. And so when I walked into the classroom and he had posters of black historians, Latino historians, uh, native historians, I was amused by it all. And when he taught the Reconstruction era, I didn't even know it. It wasn't something talked about in my family, to be completely honest. We knew that we could be uh, mathematicians, historians, writers. We had seen it. We knew that we could be singers, rappers, artists, fashion designers. We had seen it. I seen it in my own generation through social media. But I didn't know that centuries before, people had really gone up after being slaves for over 400 years to become congressmen. That's powerful. I didn't know that when my elders were crying when Barack Obama was elected the first black president, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> that people had trailblazed his journey before he even was thought of. And so to know that I could be more than that instantly clicked in my head and I saw how my black peers lit up to know that they were just more than students, that they were also the great, great, great grandchildren of legendary people, of resilient people. And so something that I took from that class was that when I'm resilient, I'm a strong black woman, and this is my history, and I should not be ashamed of sharing it to nobody. What sums up what I'm saying is actually this beautifully written line in the book it says, in sum, the Reconstruction era was a moment when black lives, black actions, and black ideas mattered. Let's get back to that. Reconstruction needs to be taught. Rosa Parks, she wasn't just somebody who got on a bus some random night, she was a spy. She knew what she was doing. Let's teach that in classrooms. It's important because the younger they know, the younger that they know that they can just achieve whatever, that things are tangible. And so those who have children, those who are teachers, really take from what we're sharing because we've gone through the school system, we're seniors, we're applying for colleges. It's never too late to change someone's lives and share their history. Thank you. All right, um, how's everybody doing tonight? Uh, what was that? I, come on. Okay, so um, I'm gonna be sharing about 
kind of, Janelle had mentioned it earlier about code switching and having to take two sets of notes being a black student as myself. Um, so I'm just gonna read a tiny excerpt from page 68 and it goes like this. I find myself feeling as if I'm touching both ground and ceiling. In schools that do not engage in healing, they simply open the wounds and entrap me in rooms where I am consumed by hypocrisy, like who authored Greek philosophies? And the statues on the campus be watching me, Washington, Jefferson, Williams, clocking me. As if to say, time's up, but I don't run laps on tracks. I run laps around the scholars of tomorrow because their new schools of thought are merely old histories borrowed. So they label me militant and black national, excuse me, black national radical, trying to put me in the learning process on sabbatical. But I don't apologize. I spit truth into the whites of eyes infected by the white lies. So that was just a little tiny excerpt from it. Yeah. So uh, that was just really powerful, but how, it, how I attach it to myself is I grew up in the suburbs, and growing up in the suburbs, I feel like I have had the best and the worst. I had the access to things that many inner city kids are still without today. But I also grew up forced into blind patriotism. When I was eight years old, I thought that Christopher Columbus and Squanto were best friends. I thought that Lewis and Clark actually hired Sacagawea as a guide for their expedition, but little did my brown eyes know that she was actually captured and exploited for her language and knowledge of the land. But these were my heroes. These were the examples that I knew. And coming into Seattle, entering a high school known for its diversity, I knew that I would be immersed into something that I wasn't quite ready for. I was a suburban kid getting adjusted to the inner city life. I hated all my past history classes, and on top of that, I really wasn't fond of school either. But why? Because nothing pertained to me. The stories that I was told about the black heroes were cruel. I learned that the Black Panther Party was vicious and they had a vendetta against America. That's what I was taught. I was taught that Malcolm X was intolerant and ill-willed, but boy, were they wrong. And deep inside me, I felt that it was wrong. And as all these years passed, I grew more and more suspicious of that narrative. So I had to do my own research. My rebellion started in the sixth grade. We had learned about ancient Egypt, and the story was so watered down that I could not function. And I failed the test on purpose, believe it or not. Because I knew that the lesson wasn't true. And my mom was upset. I was one of four black kids in the whole sixth grade class, and I had failed. I told her sorry excuses like I didn't study hard enough, but I did. I studied more than hard enough. I studied too hard, in fact. All my friends from elementary school said that I wasn't ready to be enrolled in an academy. But no, the academy wasn't ready for me. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so fast forward to my freshman year, I was utterly disappointed with the curriculum that I was learning. And Anybody out there in the audience that read a Strayer textbook were on the same wavelength, because wow. Um, so the reason that I was mad about Strayer is one, there was no representation, the units were dull, and the tests were all dates and time periods and staple figures in world history, but not because they were powerful, but because they led a conquest or any other form of oppression. Then my sophomore year came around, and I had my first black teacher, and that's Mr. Gopian. And I had Janelle in that class, and I also had Israel Presley, another white scholar. Yeah, he's a white scholars member, but he's also a new generation member. Um, and then on top of just having my first black teacher, the lessons were engaging, they were fun, they were interesting. And for the first time, I was taught a history that is based on perception, testimony, a living experience, not a textbook dialogue. As much as I wanted to learn about just black history, because for the past 12 years I was enrolled in school, I didn't learn a lot about my history other than my initial research in the sixth grade. But I will always cherish the moments that I got to spend learning about the other historically marginalized groups. I learned about the true unsung heroes of this country, the women, the LGBT, and the POC that sparked change. 
So the lessons and the stories in this book made it possible for me not to have to take two sets of notes during class. I didn't have to bounce back and forth learning what they wanted me to learn and then challenge that outside the classroom and learn what I wanted to learn, what they wouldn't tell me in the classroom. Because when you get a room full of young people and you teach them about themselves, that sparks change, that sparks a fire under everybody's tail, that tells them that they can be something great, that they're not what the textbooks paint them out to be. And that's why I think that this book is not only one for the culture, but it's something that we could all draw from it. We could all take something from it, carry it outside, and just use it in the way that we so choose. And I hope that we all choose to do that um, when we leave outside today and we don't just skim a few pages and lit it right in our bookshelves, but that we really take the time to read every page, recommend it to a fellow youth that you know or a friend, and you really engage and you become these trailblazers and you become the next person in the textbook. So, thank you. Dear Caleb, when you were almost two, we would drop off your cousin Sydney at her elementary school. The ritual went something like this. Okay, Sid, have a good day. Okay, she'd groan as she grabbed her backpack. Bye, Caleb. Bye. You'd wave and grin with your entire body. Bye, Sydney would say one last time as she shut the door. I'd roll down the car window to allow you to say bye a few more times. As I'd roll it up, you, start, you would start to whimper. It's okay, sweetie, she'll be back before you know it. And you'll be off joining her before I know it. And it's true, before I know it, Caleb, you'll be throwing your backpack on and waving goodbye as you run off across the playground. I think about that moment often and wonder about the condition of schools you'll enter. I worry about sending you, my black son, to schools that over-enroll black boys into special ed, criminalize them at younger and younger ages, and view them as negative statistics on the dark side of the achievement gap. Son, my hope for you is that your schooling experiences will be better than this, that they'll be better than most of mine. For three years of my K-8 schooling, from 7.40 a.m. until 3.05 p.m., I was black and invisible. I was bused across town to integrate a white school in southeast Portland, Oregon. We arrived at school promptly at 7.30 and had 10 full minutes before the white children arrived. We spent that time roaming the halls, happy, free, normal. Once the white children arrived, we became black and invisible. We were separated so that no more than two of us were in a class at a time. I never saw black people in our textbooks, unless they were in shackles or standing with Martin Luther King Jr. Most of us rarely interacted with a black adult outside of the aide who rode the bus with us. I liked school and I loved learning, but I never quite felt right or good. I felt very black and obvious because I knew that my experience was different from that of my peers, but I also felt invisible because this was never acknowledged in any meaningful way. I became visible again at 3.05 when I got back on the bus with the other brown faces to make our journey home. Caleb, I want your teachers to help you love being in your skin. I want them to make space for you in their curricula so that you see yourself as integral to this country's history, to your classroom's community, to your peers' learning. I want your teachers to select materials where blacks are portrayed in ordinary and extraordinary ways that actively challenge stereotypes and biases. Most of all, Caleb, I want your teachers to know you so they can help you grow. One day a teacher was trying to figure out why I was so angry since I was generally a calm, fun-loving kid. She said to me, I know you, Diane. You come from a good family. But did she know me? She knew that I lived on the other side of town and was bussed in as part of the distorted way that Portland school authorities decided to integrate the schools. 
But did she know what that meant? My mom, your grandma, got us up at 6 a.m. in order for me to wash up, boil an egg just right, fix my toast the way I like it, and wash the pan of milk so that it didn't boil over, so I could have something hot in my stomach before going to school. You know grandma, she doesn't play. We had to eat a healthy breakfast before going to school, and we had to fix it ourselves. Maybe that's what that teacher meant by good family. My teacher didn't know that we had to walk by ourselves four blocks to the bus stop and wait for the school bus to come pick us up. It took us a half hour to get to school. Once there, I had to constantly code switch, learn how not to be overly black and be better than my white counterparts. Caleb, I want your teachers to know your journey to school, metaphorically and physically. I want them to see you and all of your peers as children from good families. I don't want you to have to earn credit because of whom you're related to or what your parents do for a living. And I don't want your teachers to think that you're special because you're black and have a family that cares about you and is involved in your life. I want them to know that all children are part of families, traditional or not, that help shape and form who they are. Caleb, I hope that you will have teachers who realize they are gatekeepers. I hope they understand the power they hold and work to discover your talents, seek out your dreams and fan them rather than smother them. I hope they will see you as part of a family with gifts and rich histories that have been passed down to you. I hope they will strive to know you even when they think they already know you. I hope your teachers will approach you with humility and stay curious about who you are. When I was in fourth grade, my elementary school held a back to school night that featured student work and allowed families to walk the halls and speak with teachers. In each classroom was a student leader chosen by teachers. I'm not sure what my role was supposed to be, but at one point, a couple came in desiring to speak with Mrs. S. She was busy, so I thought I'd chat with them while they waited. As I approached them, they recoiled in fear and with panicked looks turned away from me and said, Mrs. S? My teacher looked away from the folks she was working with and said, it's okay, she's not like the rest. I don't remember what happened next. All I remember is that this seemed to be one of the first in a long line of reinsurances that I was special and not like other black boys and girls. For many years afterward, I was told on more than one occasion, you're not like other blacks. That was supposed to be a compliment. Caleb, I pray that your teachers will not look at you through hurtful racial preconceptions. I pray that they will do the work necessary to eliminate racist practices in themselves and in those around them. I pray that they will stand up for you in ways that leave you, fe that leave you feeling strong and capable. I pray that they will nurture your spirit and that you in turn will desire to be a better you. Son, I end this letter by sharing a story that grandma has told me many times and that I hope will one day resonate with you. On the first day of kindergarten when many of the kids were crying and clinging to their parents, not me, I wasn't. I was ready. I wanted to be like my three older siblings and go to school. So I gave my mom a hug, let go of her hand, waved goodbye, and found my teacher. And remember how I told you that my oldest sister taught me how to read before I went to school? The teacher found this out and used this skill, along with my desire to be at school, to teach other kids the alphabet and help them learn how to read. I believe in part, that is why I became a teacher. She saw something in me and encouraged me to develop my passion, even at this young, sweet age. That, my son, is my hope for you. I hope your teachers will love you for who you are and the promise of what you'll be. Love, Mama. Good evening, everybody. 
I'm Jesse Hagopian. Thank you so much, Diane. That was beautiful. And thanks to the, the students from Garfield. Can't thank you all enough, not only for the words you said today, but just the inspiration that I get from, from these students that keeps this work going in me. Um, and my students talked about the master narrative, and I wanted to begin by showing what that looks like and why we had to write this book, Teaching for Black Lives, why we had to put this book, book together. Um, I wanted to begin with today, and then I wanted to, to look at the movement that's grown up uh, around the country of parents, students, and teachers that are fighting to remake our schools and undo institutional racism. Before I get into my presentation, I just want to thank so many people that that made this, this possible, this, this effort possible, and so many people that have supported this movement for black lives and teaching for black lives in the schools and, and, um, and help support my work. And I want to thank deeply Katrina Johnson, who's here, um, the cousin of Charlena Lyles. Um, thank you for being here. And, and Rita Green, who I've worked closely with, at the education chair for the Seattle NAACP. Thank you so much. And Tracy Castro-Gill, I think I saw as well, there you are, yes, who's um, leading up the Seattle's ethnic studies fight um, to bring it to every school in Seattle. And John Greenberg, who we've been fighting alongside, he got pushed out of his school for doing this work and we helped to fight to get him back to his school, so thanks for coming. And, and thanks to my family, thanks. Um, none of this is possible without my wife, Sarah, who's, uh, you know, both collaborating with all the ideas uh, and and making the daily struggle uh, possible, and my mom, uh, Amy, here as well, so thank you all. So let's, let's look at why I had to, to help edit this book, okay? And I wanna start, I wanna show you a couple slides if I can get the clicker um, to work. Um, here is a textbook from Connecticut. Uh, that was used in the Connecticut public schools up and through last year, okay? So we're not going back to the 1950s and digging out the old Jim Crow textbooks. I wanna show you what's being used in the schools these days, okay? So here it is, the Connecticut adventure. <laughs> Let's go on this adventure together. <laughs> okay, so here is a homework assignment that came back uh, from this school in Connecticut. And if you look carefully, the question is, how were the slaves treated in Connecticut? And then you can see that it was the original students, and this is a fourth grade textbook. The students' answers were crossed out, okay? And originally you can see she wrote, slaves were treated badly and cruelly and were treated like animals and goods. That, that was crossed out, and then she wrote, slaves were treated like members of the family. So then this child's mother read that and said, wait a second, why did you cross out the right answer? And that, where did you come up with they were treated like family? So this smart young fourth grader said, mom, didn't you read the book? Look at the answer. Connecticut did not have many slaves. Some people owned one or two. They often cared for and protected them like members of the family. They taught them to be Christian and sometimes to read and write. Like they, like they did us a favor here. I mean, it's really appalling, right? I mean, there's a lot of examples from Southern textbooks you can look at, but let's look at this Northern textbook that youth were being taught up until this battle erupted last year and finally got this book removed, right? 
Or you can see what happened last school year when a student came home with a homework assignment that said, um, life of a slave, a balanced view. <laughs> Positive aspects, negative aspects. Well, you can tell this, this young student is about to be part of the movement for black lives. <laughs> because they wrote N-A on the positive side. Uh, and then they, they listed what went down, right, for real. They were getting some, some real history here. And that, you know, it's bad that this, this charter school teacher made this homework assignment is appalling. It's degrading to our students. It's a textbook example of reproducing institutional racism in, in our schools trying to get kids to find positive aspects of slavery. But, but it's, it doesn't stop with this one teacher who did such a cruel thing to these students. When you look at what the textbook says, you can see where they're getting it from. And that's where I have the problem. We're going to have individual teachers that we have to, you know, confront and re-educate, right? But what happens when it's on the level of the corporate textbooks that are in hundreds of thousands of uh, millions of schools, and this is what officially is being adopted by school boards to, to have our kids educated with, right? I mean, it, it's, really, it's really appalling. And you heard examples from our own textbooks here in Seattle um, from, from my students uh, earlier, right? Uh, and the first line of our book, Teaching for Black Lives, says, black students' minds and bodies are under attack. Okay, so you just saw the attack on our black students' minds, but it doesn't stop with the whitewashing of history, the erasing of their culture. It continues to a physical attack on our schools in, in many ways, and one of those is the disproportionate discipline and the school push out that's happening in schools across the country and right here in Seattle. This is the most recent discipline data from the Seattle Public Schools. Okay, this is uh, for grades five, K through five. And I wanna show you grades uh, six through 12, right? Black students suspended at over seven times the rate of white students. And now we got to realize how the school to prison pipeline fits together. Okay? It starts with a curriculum that degrades black students, erases their culture, humiliates them. And then when those kids check out of class and don't want to listen to what is being taught, they get labeled defiant, right? But maybe we should understand that defiance as resistance to a racist curriculum. Then, right, okay. Then, when they're checked out of their class because it doesn't relate to them, their zero tolerance discipline policies ready to scoop them up and push them out of the school. Right? And we can see those numbers uh, right here. And then what happens when you're suspended? Well, then you're more likely not to pass that class. And then what happens? You're more likely not to, to graduate from school. And then what happens? You're more likely not to get a job. And then what happens? You're much more likely to end up incarcerated. Right? And so we can see that this, this fight for a culturally relevant curriculum, anti-racist pedagogy, uh, is part of the fight to end the school to prison pipeline. And I wanna point out that the most disproportionate numbers in suspension rates are of black girls. You may have seen what happened on the tennis court with Serena Williams, right? When the narrative of angry black woman is applied to her, and, the, and then you can just take a game from her, right? And that is happening, that's happening to one of the most famous black women. You know what's happening to our black girls in class all the time. And, you know, studies show that nationally, 
black girls are suspended at some seven times the rate of white girls, right? As this narrative of the angry black girl gets applied to them uh, instead of seeing their full humanity. And if you haven't read this book, Push Out, by Monique Morris, you need to. We have an interview in Teaching for Black Lives with her about uh, the intersection of racism and sexism uh, and how it leads to school push out for black girls that's worth checking out in, in our book. And then I wanna talk about what happens when they get pushed out. Because right here in King County, y'all know they're getting ready to build a $200 million jail to lock up our kids, right? So that's the plan, the place where there's money to invest in the future of our kids, the future of caging our kids, but not in actually educating them. As we've seen now, they're getting ready to displace teachers from all over Seattle, including Garfield High School and Nova right across the street from us and many other schools that are gonna be disruptive to, to kids' education. But they will get ready to, to cage these, these kids and use our resources to do it. it it's really appalling. And so that movement that's grown up in this city to demand that those funds be used to turn this facility into a resource center for youth, right? To support our youth rather than just lock them up, I think is one that, that we would do well to get behind if we're in it, uh, in this movement for black lives. Uh, and then I just want to end by saying that there is a, an immense movement that's grown up called the Black Lives Matter at School movement that started right here in Seattle. Uh, it's an incredible story. It started at John Muir, where actually Wayne Now, our next speaker's son, goes. And um, it started with a group called Black Men United to Change the Narrative and Deshaun Jackson, who did incredible work. Is Deshaun in the house? Right on, man. So glad you could make it. And, you know, they did work at that school for a long time with culturally competent uh, curriculum and trainings. And then they wanted to have a day to celebrate their black youth, high five their kids as they came in and, and have an assembly about it. And the art teacher de designed a shirt that said, Black Lives Matter, we stand together. And when the right wing found out about this, they started sending threats to the school, hate mail, and then even a death threat. A bomb threat sent to an elementary school because the teachers wanted to celebrate their black students, right? And the courageous teachers ended up pulling off the event anyway, but it was probably smaller than it would have been without the intimidation. So I went, reached out to some of the educators there and said, how can we support you? And other teachers and the social equity educators uh, invited them and we had a meeting and it turned into a resolution in our union and our union supporting a day of action to have Black Lives Matter at school day. And we didn't know if anyone would participate and then the t-shirt orders started streaming in by the hundreds and then the thousands and we had some 3,000 teachers wear shirts to school that said Black Lives Matter. And it wasn't just the shirts. I mean, it's one thing to, to say that publicly and wear the shirt, but then teaching lessons about institutional racism that day was what was truly powerful. And then teachers across the country saw us on the news, and in Philadelphia, they organized it on their own. A whole week of action they expanded it to. And then Rochester, New York picked it up, and then we realized, hold up, we gotta organize this for real, and last year, we actually got on the phone and organized conference calls so that in over 20 cities across this country, they participated in a week-long Black Lives Matter at school action, teaching the 13 principles of the global network for black lives uh, each day of the week. So I'll just end by saying we're gonna do this again this week. This year, if you want to support Teaching for Black Lives, if you want to support the Black Lives Matter at School movement, 
the first week of February, we are going to be all, an all-out force um, re-educating our youth uh, and out there rallying um, to, to transform our school systems because our schools exist in a deeply racist society. And in that context, the schools will either be a force to reproduce racism or they'll be a force to challenge and undermine and fight racism. And it's up to us to decide which way that goes. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, it's lovely to see everybody here. Uh, we're just so excited about this book and, and the work that's happening around it. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking a little bit about the art of this, but also in reading a little. Um, and thanks to, to Jesse to shouting out the John Muir teachers. I see the whole crew of you up there in the corner. Um, my son's teachers and uh, Julie Trout, amazing artist, and Deshaun, and Ms. Kang's up there too. So I appreciate y'all. Um, yeah, and you, and you have to imagine like how it hit us and hit me, right? Because like this bomb threat came down to my son's school, right? And I think about who, like, who is it that makes a threat on a school that's um, you know, uh, almost 70% free and reduced lunch kids and huge amount of ELL immigrant population students and, and uh, you know, that, that's like 50% African American. I mean, like, who, like, and we're talking like six to 12 year olds, right? Who makes a bomb threat on a school like that, right? Um, anyway, on, on to more uplifting and powerful things. Uh, I mean, just real quick, we, we love this book and, and we love it for a lot of reasons, but we, the art is amazing. And I have to give a shout out to um, Nancy Zucker and Ari Bloomkatz, who both, uh, uh, Nancy was the art designer, and Ari helped us with the production, and Akua Holmes, uh, this, is the, this, is, this was Akua's, this is her art piece that became the center for this book. Um, and really, we, you know, trying to rain, think about this, like what does it mean to make Black Lives Matter in the classroom? That was sort of the question that we were thinking about as we sort of worked on the book and did all this stuff. And, and really when we got down to it, um, a lot of it had to do with like, you know, if, if anti-black racism and anti-black white supremacy uh, was about dehumanizing black people, then we needed to have a, a space that humanized black people, right? And so the book cover is, was, it was as much about life and joy, right, as, as, as anything else. And that was, that was really important to us. Uh, I'm going to flip through a few of these. Okay, here's a wonderful piece by Damon Davis that we, that we, um, uh, um, we, we, we paid, paid him to, we, we uh, hired him to do this piece for us. Um, for the intro for the book and, and also a piece by the editors, of, um, the editors of Rethinking Schools that we did for the magazine. And to be clear, we, we uh, did our very best. We always, always, always sought out uh, black artists um, for, for, for the book. This is, this is the wonderful piece of art by Howard Berry for, that accompanies Jesse's piece about the student protests, like amazing. Another Howard Berry piece. Boris, Boris Semenyanko's piece on, uh, uh, like, I just love how it fits together with taking the fight against white supremacy in the school. So what does it mean to pull back the lens on the master narrative that the students talked about, that Jesse talked about um, in, in his piece and trying to symbolize that? Oh, uh, Bob Peterson's President's Enslaved piece. Like, what, is it, what does it mean for, for fourth graders to, uh, 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 to, to look at the, to study the presidents in their textbooks and ask the question, how many slaves did they own, right? And so, and so, that, so he, goes, he turns it into both a historical lesson and also a mathematics lesson as well, and then they write to, they write to the publishers. Um, but to have that picture of, uh, uh, is, is just it's stunning to me, upsetting and stunning. Uh, Hanaya's story, art by Olivia Wise. Uh, Hanaya's um, father was, is an is a, a old school Oakland rapper, Ascari X, and he got locked up. And so Hanaya wrote this piece about what does it mean to sort of um, uh, have um, uh, a parent who's been incarcerated and, and processing that. A um, couple more pieces. Uh, Dear White Teacher, the part, art by Richie Pope. And what do you mean when you say urban? One of another one of Diane's pieces in there, right? Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's a great piece because you know, in, um, you know, I work in teacher education these days, and we always like urban classrooms, right, or urban schools. You're like, oh, you mean 
the schools where the brown kids are, right? Like, let's just be, let's be real about it. Of course, with gentrification, this is shifting too, right? Now, if you talk about su south of Seattle and so suburban education, uh, there's been such a shift of community co communities of color down there um, that uh, uh, you can really see. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that urban means the same thing anymore. Most gentrified city of the century, speaking of gentrification, you might think this article is about Seattle. It's actually about Portland, okay? <laughs> right, but peeling back the curtain, right, of, of, of what this means for our communities. We, like, the one on the left, this, this accompanies Jesse's piece about Haiti, right, and how that's sort of the disaster of capitalism and what that's, what, what, what that's meant for, for Haiti and, and schools there and education there. Um, it was such a disturbing piece, we almost like didn't put it in the book, but then the power of it is also the reason why to put it in the book, right? Um, and this other piece, uh, the piece on the right, speaks to uh, uh, an article, a chapter that's about uh, uh, the lead poisoning in Flint, right? And then the teaching of, 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 that, of that stuff. Okay, here's, here's another one of Dan. This piece goes with, with Diane's piece. Uh, the one on the left goes with um, uh, one, of, one of my chapters in the book about, about sort of the, the white supremacy and racism embedded in high-stakes standardized testing, right? And I love the spikes in, in, in the test, right? Um, and the other piece had to do with um, uh, a queering black history, okay? The, the piece on the right, just beautiful. Okay, this is a piece by Linda Christensen. Uh, the article, the chapter is raised by women, and the piece is nurtured by Maya Freeland. Freeland. And this is a piece around restorative justice, Eric Ruins. And then a wonderful piece by Molly Crabapple uh, with James Baldwin. So I'm gonna wrap up here, not by, by focusing less on this art piece, but just for two minutes, I'll read a couple pieces from the Baldwin. Uh, this is one of my Baldwin essays. This is one of my favorite essays. Um, I'd love to do, use it with my, with my teacher educators, I mean my teachers, future teachers, to get them thinking about themselves. Um, this piece was written 55 years ago. All right, um, 1963, and just to be upfront, I'm gonna I'm taking a little bit of liberty with it. I'm excerpting from it. I'm also gonna change the pronouns to gender neutral pronouns as I read, um, and then I'm gonna try. This is gonna be on the fly though, so if I mess up, don't 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 get too mad. Um, he also uses the word Negro in there, and I'm obviously not gonna use that in the context of the reading, so I'm gonna switch it up to black. Um, but just wanna let you know. So I'm this is Baldwin, and honestly. Baldwin is so amazing. I'm not, I'm not trying to pretend that I'm anywhere close to Baldwin's amazingness, um, but it's such a powerful piece that I just wanted to pull some excerpts from it because it really, the, you know, 55 years ago, and it speaks to now, okay? And I'm just going to read for a couple minutes and so we can get to the Q&A and, and, and the book signing and all that stuff. So here's Baldwin's words. This is Baldwin's Talk to Teachers. Let's begin by saying that we are living through a very dangerous time. Everyone in this room is in, is in one way or another aware of that. We are in a revolutionary situation no matter how unpopular the word has become in this country. The society in which we live is desperately menaced, not by Khrushchev, but from within, like shades, right, of Russian, Russian meddling. Um, to any citizen of this country who figures, them, figures themselves as responsible, and particularly those of you who deal with the minds and hearts of young people, must be prepared to quote unquote go for broke. Or to put it another way, you must understand that in, that in the attempt to correct so many generations of bad faith and cruelty, when it is operating not only in the classroom but in society, you will meet the most fantastic, the most brutal, and the most determined resistance. There is no point in pretending that this won't happen. Now the crucial paradox which confronts us here is that the whole process of education occurs within a social framework that is, and is designed to perpetuate the aims of society. Thus, for example, the boys and girls who were born during the era of the Third Reich when educated to the purposes of the Third Reich became barbarians. The paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which they are being educated. The purpose of education, finally, is to create, a person, uh, create in a person the ability to look at the whole world for themselves, to make their own decisions, to say, to say to themselves that this is black or this is white, to decide for themselves whether there is a God in heaven or not. To ask questions of the universe, but then learn to live with those questions is the way they achieve their own identity. But no society is really anxious to have that kind of person around. What, society, what societies really ideally want is a citizenry which will simply obey the rules of society. If society succeeds in this, that society is about to perish. 
The obligation of anyone who thinks of themselves as responsible is to examine society and try to change it and to fight it at no matter what risk. This is the only hope that society has. This is, only the, way, this is the only way that societies change. All of this centers the child's consciousness much sooner than we as adults would like to think it does. As adults, we are easily, easily fooled because we are anxious to be fooled. But children are very different. Children, not yet aware that it's dangerous to, to look too, deep, too deeply at anything, look at everything, look at each other, and draw their own conclusions. They don't have the vocabulary to express what they see, and we, their elders, know how to, how to intimidate them very easily and very soon. But a black child looking at the world around them, though they cannot, quite, though they cannot know quite what to make of it, is aware that there is a reason why their mother works so hard, why their father is, is always on edge. They are aware that there is some reason why if they sit down in the front of the bus, their father or mother slaps them and drags them to the back of the bus. They are aware that there's some terrible weight on their, on their parents' shoulders, which menaces them. And it isn't long, in fact, it begins when they're in school before they discover the shape of their own oppression. There is something else that, that, the Negro, that the black child can do. Every street boy looking at society has produced, has, has produced him. Looking at the standards of that society, which are not honored by anybody, looking at, looking at your churches and the government and politicians, understand that this structure is operated for someone else's benefit not for theirs. And Baldwin goes into a long explanation of, of social relations and, 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 and lands at this spot. The point of all this is that black people were brought here as a source of cheap labor. They were indispensable to the economy in order to justify the fact that they were treated as though they were animals. The white republic had to brainwash itself into believing that they were indeed animals and deserved to be treated like animals. Therefore, it is almost impossible for any black child to discover anything about their actual history. The reason is, is that this animal, once they, once they suspect their own, their own worth, once they start believing that they are humans, they've begun to attack the entire power structure. This is why America has spent such a long time keeping black people in their place. Why am I trying to suggest to you that, what, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that it was not an accident. It was not an act of God. It was not done by well-meaning people muddling into something which they didn't understand. It was a deliberate policy hammered into place in order to make money from black flesh. Baldwin ends this piece speaking directly to teachers. Quote, I begin by saying that one of the paradoxes, I began by saying that one of the paradoxes of education was that precisely at the point at which you begin to develop a conscience, you must find yourself at war with your society. It is your responsibility to change society if you think of yourself as an educated person, and on that basis of the evidence, the moral and political evidence, one is compelled to say that this is a backward society. Now, if I were a teacher in this school, or any black school, and I was dealing with black children who were who were in my care only a few hours of every day and would then return to their homes into the streets, children who have an apprehension of their future, which with every hour grows grimmer and darker, I would try to teach them. I would try to make them know that those streets, those houses, those dangers, those agonies by which they are surrounded are criminal. I would try to make each child know that these things are the result of a criminal conspiracy to destroy them. I would teach them that if they intend to be a, to be a human, they must at once decide that is that uh, that they are stronger than this conspiracy and they must, that they must never make peace with it. And that one of the weapons for refusing to make peace with it and for destroying it depends on what, what they decide they are worth. I would teach them that, they are currently very, that there are very few standards in this country uh, which are worth a person's respect. That it is up to them to change these standards for the sake of life, for sake of life and health of this country. I would teach them that the press they read is not as free as it, as, as it says it is that they can do something about that too. I would try to make them know that just, as Ameri that just as American history is longer, larger, more various, and more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it, so is the world larger, more daring, more beautiful, and more terrible, but principally larger, and that it belongs to them. I would teach them that they don't have to be bound by the expediencies of any given administration, any given policy, any given morality, that they have the right and the necessity to examine everything. I would suggest to them that, that, they are, that, that, this is a living, that they are living at the moment in an enormous province. America is not the world, and if America is going to become a nation, 
She must find a way, and this child must help, help her find a way to use the tremendous potential, tremendous potential and tremendous energy with uh, which this child represents. If this country does not find a way to use that energy, it will be destroyed. All right, that's it, thank you. Hello, um, I'm a product of Seattle Public Schools, Garfield, so forth. Bulldogs. Bulldogs. <laughs> um, I was one of the founding members of the Black Student Union out at the UW, which started the EO, the Education Opportunity Program under Dr. Odegaard, and I went to medical school there, and now I'm retired. And it's beautiful to see you folks there, and this is just a wonderful program, but it's very frustrating to me to see that since I was there, went through, retired, and then not much has changed. In fact, some of it's really frustrating um, because it looks like some of it went backwards. Some of the things have gone backwards. So my question is, um, I'm seeing a lot of programs now, thank goodness, for um, young African-American women and just women in general, which is good. But, um, let me see how I'm gonna put this. Um, and the women's mu movement is good. And I'm a mother of African-American daughter and son. And both have done well. I put them through private school in Seattle because of what you guys faced and what I saw happen to the school after I went through public schools. So thank goodness some things are coming back under you. But what I'm wondering is, uh, like, as an African-American young woman, um, some of the opportunities and programs as I was looking at downstairs looked like they were opening up. And when I've been out to the university to see the, um, for the anniversaries, 50th anniversary recently for the Black Student Union and EOP programs, I've seen a number of black women um, in the program as long as, as far as other minorities, which is what we, did it for, which is beautiful. But I've seen a number of young men, I live near um, Rainier Beach, and I've seen a number of young men personally who were very smart when they were young and did well in middle school, Madrona programs. High school started deteriorating. And now I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing that women are getting the opportunity, but I wanna know, I don't see any young black men anymore. Where are they? What, what can we, well, a minority, Af African American and Hispanic, I'm gonna say both because it's, it, I'm feeling the same for both. But I wanna know, I don't see them anymore. I still live in the central area. What can we do and where are they? I, I mean, what, where? Um, so I grew up um, around a bunch of young men. In fact, a lot of people in my household are young black men as well. And I have a lot of friends at Garfield and Rainier Beach and other predominantly POC uh, schools. Well, Garfield is actually no longer, believe it or not, but definitely beach and south somewhat. Um, aside from that, the black men were growing up in a time where the defense mechanism is to hide away from these issues. A lot of us are student athletes and um, we're not allowed to have that platform of I can speak out against this, I feel comfortable speaking out against this because then you get reprimanded by your coaches and scholarships and just these people that you think are your friends because they smile in your faces. So a lot of it is a defense mechanism. They're still very intelligent. I have conversations with a lot of them in fact, um, a member of our group, Savelle Smalls, um, he's one of the biggest student athletes in the state, and he even, in the country even, and he's expressed that sometimes, like, he doesn't even feel comfortable himself speaking out because it could really backlash. So it's not that they're shying away from being educated because a lot of us are still educated these days. We still care, we still have opinions on these issues, but it's just the world, the weight of the world is so heavy on our shoulders that if we say something, everything could crack. So in, 
and then to answer the second part of your question about what we can do, I feel like we need to have these conversations with our young black men and really know that you're powerful. Like Chardonnay had said, tell them about the leaders that they never heard before. Yes, we hear about MLK. Yes, we hear about Malcolm X, but tell us more. You know, just educate us on these historical icons, these unsung heroes that don't get the recognition that they deserve so that way they can know that they're more than just the athlete that society deemed them to be and that they could be a scholar, they could be the next president, they could be the next mayor, the next, you know, um, just anything they put their mind towards. I feel like that just empowering and having those conversations, that open dialogue will really spark an interest in young men to step up more. Good evening, everyone. My name is um, Latasha Levy. I teach ethnic studies at the University of Washington. I teach African-American history and culture. I moved here two years ago from Charlottesville, and you all have heard about Charlottesville in the, in the news, but I've been more appalled by the racism that I've encountered here in the progressive Seattle. Um, I want to first say th that I'm so inspired and so proud of the seniors here on stage. You all are phenomenal. You all are phenomenal. Truly, truly. And if, if I can help you in any way, if anybody can just give them scholarships right now, do that. But I want to underscore that, um, just to plant a seed in the conversation, and I want to thank you all for this amazing work, is just to underscore for people in the audience and also for teachers who are primarily white, and also for those who are non-black but people of color, it's important for everyone to know this history, to know the history of slavery, to know the history of modernity, to know that Africans um, contribute, uh, invented civilization. So it's not just about um, teaching for black lives. You all have to teach for your lives, okay? We teach for black lives so that all of us get free. So even if you don't have black kids in your classes, it is critically important to teach them the truth about our history just so they understand the world that we live in. Thank you. And the last thing I just want to point out is that the cultural ignorance that is so pervasive um, in white identity and white history, it is, it's a matter of life and death for other people. And as you had mentioned, like we create these spaces, these educational spaces in terms of this propaganda and how it dehumanizes black people, that cultural ignorance and cultural violence also dehumanizes white people. And we see this in the, in, the, in the very fact that so many white people in this country have a hard time to even empathize with basic human um, emotions and understanding of why black people are kneeling at a football game or why black people are protesting in the streets. And so this is also about de the dehumanization of white folks, not just about a deficit in black folks, because as you can see from these young people on the stage who mentioned that they were intimidated, as stellar as they are, Okay, that they still second guess themselves. This isn't, they have no, uh, they have no issues with, um, you know, feeling less than or having low self esteem because there's something in them, all right, they're stellar. But this is also about uh, the, how this cultural ignorance is violent for black people and for white people as well. I'd um, offer a curriculum and uh, coaching around cultural intelligence um, next month. So if you, anyone is interested, I'd be happy to work with people. But thank you so much for the work that you do. Y'all killed it tonight. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, my name is Joseph Erickson. I'm a teacher in, I'm an ethnic studies teacher in Edmonds. Um, I was a student of Diane Watson's at Lewis and Clark. And uh, so two things. First of all, DW, it's amazing to see you. Um, I remember right before I graduated and I, there was only one person of color in our cohort. I remember that. And I wanna get to Wayne about a question about that in a second. But you told me that you would trust me to teach your kids. And I didn't understand at the moment how heavy that was and how intense that was, but tonight I was moved to tears by you speaking and I've heard you tell that story before, but it's, it, it has a lot of weight to it five years later. Five years on though, um, Wayne, uh, you know, what's the state of getting people of color into the classroom as teachers um, at that institutional level? Because I know when I went to Lewis and Clark, we had Tasha, we had one person who was a person of color 
out of 20 teachers. And I know that you, DW, when you had to go through those applications, like, is it getting, is it getting better? Is it still like an institutionalized issue? Where are we at these days? Here, here, I mean, here in Washington, it's still, it's still the institutionalized issue, right? I mean, I always see it as every level, every credential, like, uh, you know, you, you know, Jesse showed, showed the stats from, from the dis discipline rates. It's, I think it's like every level becomes a filter, right? Who, who graduates, who gets into college, who persists, gets their BA, who persists, gets their MA, having met all the stuff. And then here in Washington, it's like past the EdTPA, plus the Westie and the West, like there's, there's the whole stack of tests, right? And so then, uh, and that becomes this, this incredible filtering mechanism. Um, I do think, I mean, there's some promise in, you know, for instance, at UW Bothell, where I'm at, um, you know, our undergraduate population is, you know, over 50% like non-white students and it's over 50% first-gen college students. And so we're talking about how do, we, how do we figure out a way to build a pipeline for a faster degree to, 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 to credential, right, so that we can take advantage of the fact that we have these students in our undergrad programs, right, and create a pathway to teaching. But that, honestly, that's, that's those kinds of pathways and, and figuring, out, figuring out how to help folks. Like, I, you know, I mean, my goal, I, I want to take the ethnic studies majors at UW Bothell and just say, okay, come on, be, be a social studies teacher and let's just, like, move, it, move you in this space, right? Um, and, and there's obstacles to that and the desires there. We just have to figure out how to institutionalize that stuff so we can get around some of those other, you know, some of the other inst institutionalized racism and stuff that we're dealing with. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, my name is Brandy Flood. I'm a native of Seattle, graduated from Rainier Beach High School. Um, thank you, okay. <laughs> Great things come out of Rainier Beach. I start off with that at work. I don't even talk about my college degrees. I start off with Rainier Beach because there's academic excellence there. Um, my question is, if you guys have any ideas, the way the Seattle Public Schools is set up to pit us against each other, and it really frustrates me as a PTA person to go and advocate for Rainier Beach. We're 97% of the kids of color. We're the last of everything. You can't, I can't tell you how much it pisses me off to go to open house and we get the teacher that's this their first year in teaching, and the first thing they say is, this is my first time teaching at an urban school. Um, how can we organize um, better as a, as a community, not school by school, to get resources, because the bottom line is we need money to be able to achieve the things that we see at Garfield, that we see at uh, Lakeside, that we see at Ingram. And so do you guys have any suggestions around that? I hate just going and fighting for Beach and I'm fighting against Franklin and Garfield. All those kids belong to me, all those brown kids belong to us and I don't like the way that feels. Thank you so much. That's such an important question. Um, the first thing we should acknowledge is that the school district has been trying to close Rainier Beach for so long. Instead of support it, instead of infuse it with the resources it needs to, to be more successful, they've been trying to close. So it was on the school closure list in, 20, uh, in 2008. And that was really where actually the group that I'm part of, Social Equity Educators, came out of trying to unite all the different schools who are slated for closure in a common struggle, because each school had their own, like, Save My School campaign going on, but we shouldn't be closing any schools in one of the richest cities the world has ever known, right? I mean, we need to step back and look at the fact that the two richest people who have ever lived that would make the pharaohs jealous, right, live here. And there is more than enough to make sure every single built school building and classroom has all the supplies and materials and small class sizes and restorative justice counselors and, and you know, school psychologists and nurses. I mean, there is plenty of money in this city. Um, and yet Rainier Beach is the only school that hasn't gotten remodeled yet, right? And so... Uh, because it's South End, because it's predominantly students of color, and that's part of the way institutional racism works in our school system, and we have to build a united struggle, because if it's just you fighting for those resources, you, won't, you can't win by yourself, right? But we also know, we, other schools have a little bit more, but no, none of us have what this, these kids deserve, right? And if we're gonna get 
the school system our kids deserve, we're all going to have to band together because there's many more of us than there are those two richest people, right? Those two people wouldn't stand a chance if we were able to organize and come together, right? Um, and to do that, we have to break down the barriers of racism that divide us, first of all. Um, and we have, to, we have to build a united struggle to demand that that wealth be invested in our youth instead of just saying that empty platitudes, we care about kids and schools, and then we see what right now, they're, get, they're displacing teachers all over the school district right now, interrupting our kids' education in the middle of the school year. So we don't believe you, right? And we're saying we have a vision for what our schools should look like. Part of that is in this book that we're, we're bringing forward, but you heard it from the voices in, in the audience today. We have a community of people that know, and the students know what they, what they need to be taught. Um, now we have to reorganize society so that those resources and that wealth is being used to support, to support our kids. And so part of that, our struggle that we're dedicated to is, is inside the classroom, changing the conversation to empower our kids to be part of this fight. But it's not enough to tell the kids, you guys go out and fight. We have to also show them what that looks like. And that's what the Black Lives Matter at School movement allows educators to join in that fight uh, and to redefine what the school system should be and how it, it can fight against institutional racism and for the resources that all of our schools need. Um, I also just wanted to like piggyback something off what Mr. Hagopian said and something I've been noticing just growing up a lot. Um, a lot of times, especially um, black students, a lot of us do live in the South End and a lot of us that is like commuting to the CD and we all are from the South End and I think an issue that we need to do and it's not only just for white people but black people as well is that us from other schools need to come together and also help Rainier Beach for example because I've heard a lot of stuff and I have a lot of friends who go to Rainier Beach and they tell me about some of the issues and stuff or just I heard they had to have school closed for a week one time last year because of something was wrong in the building with the air or something and that's ridiculous because that's cutting out of their own education. And so I really think a big issue is is that we keep on saying it's like a South End problem and it's not a South End problem, it's a Seattle problem and we need, it needs like one whole, it's our community and we need to stop thinking of like different ends, north end, south end, central district, we're all just one. And I think what we need to do is come together and have each one of those people and different groups come together to help Rainier Beach because I do think Rainier Beach should and is the number one priority right now because a lot of unfair things have happened to that school for years now. And we can't sit here and say that we're done, and say that we're advocating for Black Lives Matter and stuff when Rainier Beach is a perfect example of their lives obviously do not matter. So, yeah. Thanks everybody, we really appreciate you coming out tonight. I hope you enjoy the book. And if you want to get it signed, come on down and, and we'll, uh, we'll sign copies of the book. Have a great evening, everybody. <laughs>